713-526-KPFT. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well... Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis and I am your host. Let me tell you folks, as you know, we are now in our fun drive and having a fun drive brings you people, brings you experts that can give you unfiltered information and that is what we have for you today. So before we get started with our distinguished guests, I want to remind you guys that this is a program that is worth keeping on air because we give you unfiltered news and we give you what's going to be necessary for you to make up to have an objective opinion. Is that right, Roxy? Yes, it is. Now, it is important, first of all, folks, that you give us a call at 713-526-5738, 713-526-KPFT. And Roxy always says it this way. 713 Jam KPFT. And it's really important that we get calls in tonight. I know usually we're on call-in shows, so we love to hear from you. But it is really important that you call in, especially this week, because, you know, we need to stay on the air. We need to keep Egberto, you know, flapping his jaws and talking about <laughs> what's going on. We need it. We need it. It's it's worth it. You're and your um, money is going to not only a great cause, but we also have. I was here earlier today, at Berto, and it was we were. It was the morning crew. It was the day crew. People were pumped, answering phones. We have so many tickets and so many things we want to give away that people need to know about, because we have tickets to concerts. We have co tickets to comedy balls. We've got, you know, any major person that is coming in to town cynthia woods pavilion house of blues fitzgerald's anything it's there we have it and so if you want to you know if you want to go see these instead of giving it to like Ticketmaster or whatever you know how you buy your tickets you know corporations like corporations like that egberto that yes. we always like to talk about yes give it to kpft and we will give you your music whatever you want to see now without further ado it's time for the weekly blog post. Folks, Rula Jabril will be the featured guest on Politics Done Right today. Rula Jabril is a journalist, a commentator, and author of Miral, a novel translated into 15 languages that sold millions of copies worldwide and a film that was the first ever premiered in the UN Assembly Hall. She also authored the International Fins Europa award-winning book, The Bride of a Swan, that was translated into five languages. Her third book, Rejected, is a non-fiction about immigration in Europe. She wrote and produced the film Permesso di Giorno about the death penalty in China, the United States, and Iran during the UN debate on the death penalty in 2008. Rula Jabril is the brave journalist that had the spine to go into a mainstream media studio, an MSNBC studio, and speak the truth at her own peril, while concurrently writing an article on the refugee crisis on the Texas border and listening to Ronan Far Farrow Daly on MSNBC. I listened somewhat inattentively as Rula Jabril gave a spirited narrative on the biased coverage given to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I had not heard such a brave defense and pushback on MSNBC or any other network. I immediately stopped what I was doing, recorded the interview and edited it for internet consumption because you know what? I knew traditional media would attempt to make it a one-day story. The blogosphere would not. I immediately wrote that I wondered how much longer before her appearances on TV would end. It would not be long as Rula Debril, Jabril tweeted a message soon after stating all of her TV appearances were canceled. Interestingly, she appeared one more time on MSNBC's 
all in with Chris Hayes in what seemed to be MSNBC's attempt to clean up the incident, but instead proved her point. Rula Javril, uncharacteristically shallow defense of the, or rather, Chris Hayes, uncharacteristically shallow defense of the vast traditional main media coverage, she proved it. She proved it. Rula Javril is a real unbiased journalist unlike most. She has a story to tell the metropolitan Houston's area, six million people, and the many others that are going to be streaming and podcasting on the Internet through the country and in the world. Because I made sure that this was put out there on the Daily Coast and other places. Because, folks, what we want to make sure is that real news gets out there. But before we go to Rula, this is the beginning of our summer sizzle drive. So please remember to call in and make your pledge. And if it were not for you, we could not cover great guests like Rula and other authors, journalists, politicians, and experts. So, folks. Absolutely. Absolutely. You said it, Edberto. We, we again. said it. And who do we have with us right now? We have Rula Jibril. Rula, if that's the case, decide. why can't American leaders be more honest? Well, because of APAC and because of the money behind it and because of Sheldon Adelson and because of all of us in the media. We are ridiculous. We are disgustingly biased when it comes to this issue. Look at how many airtime Netanyahu and his folks uh, have on air on a daily basis. Andrea Mitchell and others. I never seen one Palestinian being interviewed on these same issues. <laughs> Israel has a lot of support because there's a kind of cultural affinity between Americans and Israelis and they see them as less foreign in a lot of ways uh, than they do with Palestinians. Let me take you behind the curtain of cable news business for a moment. If you appear in a cable news network, you trash that network and one of its hosts by name on any issue, Gaza, infrastructure spending, sports coverage, or funny internet cat videos, the folks of the network will not take kindly to it. Not some grand conspiracy at work, fairly predictable case of cause and effect. But I know Rula Jabril. I like Rula Jabril. We've had a lot of conversations on this topic and others. Place Most Americans think, OK, Israelis are minding their own business, and Palestinians wake up one day in Gaza, and they decide, OK, let's me fire missiles. Right. This is not what's happening. They don't know anything about the siege, the 1.8 yes. million Palestinians living under siege in extreme poverty, with 90% that don't have access even to water. To the military occupation in the West Bank, they don't understand and they don't even know. It and I'm not changed. talking as a Palestinian, I'm talking of somebody that works in the media that feel the feel the responsibility towards my audience and feel that you know what, we have ethics. And and I came to journalism after living under occupation, coming here believing in one thing, that America is about two or three things. One of them is freedom of speech. So when I come back from Europe after uh, after being there and, and look at the media here, I am stunned. And I am actually concerned that our interest in the world, our stand in the world is being undermined think, because of our response. Let me just say this. If there is violence, we cover it. If there's no violence, we don't cover it. If there is violence, we cover it. If there's no violence, we don't cover it. If there is violence, we cover it. If there's no violence, we don't cover it. And I think that creates an imbalance that, that puts us in a situation in which the forces that are pursuing violence end up being the most empowered. Because if you sit quietly and you negotiate, like Mahmoud Abbas has been doing in the West Bank, in the Palestinian Authority, no one covers it. No one covers it. No one covers it. No one covers it. Rula, welcome to Politics Done Right. Well, well, we are trying to get you on Politics Done Right, so bear with us one second. We're going to clean this up. So, anyhow, Rula had a an incident that she had both on the, let me see where, I think she did it for Real Story. She also had a stint on CNN. She Okay, great. Let's go. Well, and here we have Rula. Rula, how are you doing tonight? 
How are you? Thank you for having me. Look, I am extremely happy to have you because I tell you what you've made you've made our day. So I, I understand that you're you're pretty busy now with your a, a whole lot of other interviews that you got to do. So let's get busy with asking you some specific questions. Um, let me ask you when when you started this interview with with uh, Roland uh, Ronan Farrow, it it was quite interesting because he seemed to have opened the door by telling you that. Uh, most of the presidents have always had problems with Israel and given them heartburn. You immediately came out and made that spirited defense or spirited, not I don't want to say accusation, but stayed in the bias, that nature of the media. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, when Ronan Farrer asked me about why every president, every diplomat, every politician that face the issue of criticizing Israel, then ultimately back off because they're concerned and scared and, and, and why they're scared. And I said because of Sheldon Adelson, because of APAC, which is the lobbyist group, and because of the money behind it. And ultimately it's because of us in the media who are introducing and, and presenting only one side of the story, a very disgustingly biased view of the conflict without talking about the underlining causes that, that lead to, to flaring of the violence every two or three years. We don't talk about the occupation. We don't talk about the siege. It's a tragedy. And because we shape public opinion, public opinion selects uh, uh, influence politicians. Politicians will not do what is right. They do what is popular. So without our uh, presence in the media, without us being the, the, the fourth dog, the guard, of, of the truth, who will do that? No one. And when it comes to this issue, look, there's a campaign of intimidation, of fear. There's a campaign of smearing and destruction of, of the truth over and over. It's almost propagandistic when it comes to the Israeli issue. Without challenging Israeli officials, without any pushback, when it comes to their analysis of, and their destructive policies, not only towards the Palestinians, but towards their own community. Absolutely. It's interesting. You, uh, one of the statements you made to Chris Hayes and All In with Chris Hayes is that bias coverage is dangerous because it actually affects policy. So why don't you kind yeah. of expand on that for me? Well, it's very simple. Look at, if you look at, at the Iraqi war, let's look at our backyard, our home. We were presented during the Iraqi war with no evidence, with little evidence that were fake evidence of the presence of uh, weapons of mass destruction. And you remember when Condoleezza Rice and Absolutely. others went on CNN and said they will be a mushroom cloud and Saddam Hussein will have the capability to attack us? Nobody in the media challenged them enough to prove with evidence and to give evidence to the public opinion so we can decide whether the, the war was right or wrong. So we were backing an administration that lied regarding to this. And we're responsible of that because the New York Times printed that, CNN, and many other outlets, networks, start talking about it. And that was a big mistake. We lost 5,000 soldiers, 40,000 were injured, and trillions of dollars in that war. And we lost the war. Look at the Israeli, uh, the Israeli uh, coverage of the Gaza invasion. Israel has been dealing with Hamas in Gaza for the last eight years. Gaza was under siege. That did not topple Hamas, did not weaken Hamas. Actually, it weakened the moderates on the other side. Absolutely. And what happens is we are not even questioning their policies. You know, one of my favorite journalists, and he works for Channel 4 in the U.K., asked the prime minister of Israel and his spokesperson, he said, listen, you try to bombard them six times since they won the election in 2006. <laughs> you bombarded Hamas. This didn't work. Isn't it time to, to try another way? Isn't it time to talk to them eventually and make a deal? Maybe there's another way. And I think in that moment, the prime minister didn't know what to say, and his spokesperson didn't know what to say. And I think if we never challenge them on these issues, they will never come around. 
Now, we affect public opinion, and we influence politicians. Now, I'm going to go off the topic a bit of bias and ask a question because you just opened a door that I really want to explore. Do you think the mere fact that it's rather irrational to continue bombing people this way, that it is a possibility that what we're really looking for is a, a an attrition of the people in Gaza and the West Bank with the expectation that, that, in, that, that not being able to tolerate that anymore, people just move on look i i really believe in peace and believe in the security of israel will come and and the independence and freedom of the palestinian will come through a political agreement there's no military solution to the to the to the issue what we do is we delay that agreement and we delay a solution but the, i mean it's clear if you look at the policies of israel in the west bank where hamas is not even there the policy of, the, of Israel there is actually military occupation. That shows you that they, they are in bad faith. There's no good intention to give the Palestinians their freedom. And this is, bottom line, is what leads Hamas to be much more stronger and empowered because they exploit the pain and the desperation of the Palestinian people. We and, need to break that cycle, and we need to break it now. And, isn't and we it- need to free our politicians, American politicians, from the fear of speaking their mind. Interesting enough, during the interview that you had with Amy Goodman, you stated that alternate writer, or they, uh, she stated that alternate uh, writer Max Blumenthal spoke to an anonymous pr- producer that said a top-down intimidation campaign aimed at presenting an Israel-centric view of the attack on the Gaza Strip. Is that something that you saw while being within the guts of these different um, networks? I did not see this. I, I truly did not see. I can't say that I saw it, but I'm sure there's sources that talk to, to Max Blumenthal that explain to him these things. I'm sure there are producers and other people. I did not see that because I was simply a commentator, simply an analyst uh, and contributor. That means that I come sometimes whenever I'm needed. But the fact that I was talking about, that I was invited to talk about Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Israel, and Palestine, and Egypt, uh, made me become somehow somebody that is used sometimes whenever there's crisis. But when I appeared the last time in Chris Hayes and they labeled me a Palestinian journalist, it was I saw immediately what they were trying to do. It was an attempt to deflect the criticism by covering up and, and actually trying to discredit me as myself biased. It would have made that criticism even if I was Brazilian, not Palestinian. I happen to be born in Palestine, but I have a hold an Israeli citizenship, and I'm married to a Jewish man. I live in New York City. I am an American, and I believe in the ideal of this nation. Freedom of speech is not by chance number one or number two in the Constitution. It's the most relevant thing to us in the rest of the world who actually come to America, look up to, to American standards, and believe in that. I criticized, when I worked in, in Italy and in Egypt, I criticized the government. I was not shut down. Here they are pretending for me to shut my brain, and I can't shut off my brain. Well, that was the reason I said in, in the blog post, one of the bravest commentators on TV, because it's not easy to do what you, what you did. Now, one question. Do you, have, do you have time for two more questions? Please, yes. Excellent. Well, here it goes. Tell us a little... Tell. Tell America a little bit about the story about Ayman Mohayedin, because that is, that is essential to this story as far as what occurred in Gaza. Look, Ayman Mohayedin's story is an emblematic story. It's a tipping point. It was a tipping point for me. It's what encouraged me to, to, to actually come out. When Ayman Mohayedin's story happened, Ayman Mohayedin was a reporter for NBC and for MSNBC. He was in Gaza. He was talking to children on the beach. Four kids. Then Israeli fired, uh, launched a strike, fired a missile, killed the four kids. There is a scene where Ayman Mohidin is filming the kids running on the beach. The second time you see it, four of the kids were dead. So he followed them to the, to the hospital. One of them is still injured. He's going to surgery. And there were six kids, actually. Four of them died. One of them is going to surgery. And he asked the kid, what you were doing on the beach? And he said, we were playing. We're simply playing. The kids were between 9 and 12 years old. 
And that was a shocking moment. I saw the footage over and over and over and over. Ayman Muhyiddin reported about the episode, talked about it. He witnessed it firsthand. He was talking to the kids before. He sent on Instagram and on Facebook comments saying, this is what happened today. These were children. The officials from the IDF, Israeli Defense Force, said that Hamas was there. There's no evidence that Hamas was there. Then guess what? He was pulled away from Gaza and somebody else was sent. Somebody else that is actually a seasoned reporter but doesn't have, didn't witness what happened there. Yes. So uh, this, is, this is a story. Then social media rose up and Ayman Wahidin was forced. Somehow social media forced the administration and, and the, the, the executive at MSNBC to bring him back. And he was brought back because of that. You know, what a lot of these people don't understand that sometimes the, the, knowing the language helps the reporting. And like yourself, Absolutely. who speaks both Hebrew and Arabic, it, it is important that the news is related to people who can actually be dual in yes. your language that can get yes. the nuances of language that many people don't actually get. So that, that is great. Now, on Reli CNN's Reliable Sources, something interesting happened. You had a great interview. You got a chance to, to tell your story. You got a chance to say some of the things that you said here. But after you left the air, something happened. And what happened when you left the air was what the person said, which was, she has, and I want to quote it correctly, he said that you had a, a opinions that were controversial. Now, well, when a in America... If, if truth when, is controversial in this country, I'm proud to be one, a controversial person. <laughs> bringing reality and opening the windows and letting the air and the light come in and exposing certain things controversial, I am happy to be that. I am sure that whoever was exposing the Iraqi war lies was considered controversial in 2003. Right. I hope in this country controversial means and I, I thought about his words, actually. I thought very, very deep. And I look, I know that I, I, I touched a nerve. But the fact that I touch a nerve, it's time to post attention on the nerve. Why we are so afraid of criticizing so much Israel? Why this fear and intimidation? And why we don't let our people, the American people, see the reality and the truth? Because they might see something else. That something else might affect and influence D.C. and politics, then it's good. It's a, it's a service to our community and to our audience. It's time to give them reality and truth. Well, let me tell you, uh, uh, Rula, over in, uh, on several different venues now, from the Daily Coast to uh, many of the Coffee Party networks and so forth, uh, people that are aiming for true, unbiased reporting, these things are reported, and, and suffice it to say that there are many Jewish people here in the United States that are trying to get yes. their message out. Yes. They are trying to yes. tell the truth. Yes, yes, and I believe that together we can find the truth. And I'm so grateful to the support of so many people that followed me these days on Instagram and Twitter, and, and they were very, very helpful and supportive, and they stood by me in this moment, and, and I, I felt not alone. I felt not lonely. I felt that I was supported by a community of truth tellers and fact checkers, and what this country really stands for. Well, look, uh, Ms. Jabril, I know you have some other interviews to do, so what I want to tell you first of all is thank you very much for giving us this time. Thank you for having me. But one more important thing I want to get out there to all the people that are listening, both here in Houston and around the world on the network, is that Social media reigns, the internet reigns, and the, the Rula's message is going to still be getting out there because of this media. But do remember, something called net neutrality is around the corner, and we must ensure that we maintain it so that these messages can continue to go out. Miss Rula Jabril, I really thank you for spending some time with us here at KPFT. Thank you for having me. And thank you have you so a much. wonderful night. I know it's late out there, thank so you. you take care now, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Now. Where do you find these women, these outspoken women, Egberto? Like, they, I'm so impressed. Good for her. Listen, I have an outspoken wife, an outspoken <laughs> daughter, so I'm used to outspoken 
women. Good. I am run by women. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so, I mean, before we get into our fund, well, let me just say the fundraising thing real quick. Folks, look, we bring you good people. We also bring you people that are making a difference in this country. And we want to be able to bring you unbiased information. That young lady, Rula Jibril, she is not an anti-Jewish woman. She is married to a Jewish man. She is not an anti-Palestinian woman. She is Palestinian. What she is is a woman who can tell the truth that can actually make a difference in the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I won't attempt to be that expert because there's a lot to know in this whole situation she's lived it she's been reporting on it for several years and for that for just telling the truth she was removed from network tv but she was not removed from the internet and we will continue we will maintain truth over the networks if you our potential members and loyal listeners and loyal listeners and those who are coming back, take it away for me, please. We are having our fun drive. We're having our fun drive this week. So if you call, because normally we're a call-in show, and we love hearing from you guys. But, you know, this week we're dedicating our phone lines just so that we can hear how much you love not only us, not only Egberto and his show. Uh, we are dedicating it to donations. We are willing to give you stuff for your donations. We want to know that we what we're doing matters and you know what we want to keep these venues open for people like Raul 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 Rula Jibril <laughs> Rula okay Rula we want to keep like this open for people like Rula you know so if you get banned from MSNBC or CNN or Fox News what ever just come over to KPFT and speak your mind and we need your support to make that happen so we can have the variety of shows that we have on on the station keep doing what they're doing so if you call to want to talk to Egberto I know you guys really want to talk to me but that's okay yes they do <laughs> of course they want to talk to you Roxy this is you are my partner Roxy yes um so if you if you call us this week we won't be able to talk but next week we'll definitely be back but right now we need to hear those phones ring we need to hear the love we need to hear it all it's just it's now na- it's now or never we have goals we need to reach so that this station stays afloat listen we need you folks and thank you for Hell listening yeah. to <laughs> politics done right